All right, so I'll also st say this is going to be related to, this is related to Francis Brown's work, and he's going to talk about that in the next talk. Um, sort of, I started up here in G greater than or equal to 2, and I came down to genus 1, that's me, and Francis has come up from genus 0. Right? So we sort of meet in the middle here. But anyway, genus 1, I think, is, so these are, I'm talking about here mapping class groups in high genus, and here the mapping class group is SL2Z, and here uh, gamma 0, 4 is pi 1 of P1 minus 0, 1, and infinity. So this is um, the story of mixed Tate motives, more or less, and you might say this is the story of Tyke, uh, mixed Teichmuller motives, and this is sort of like mixed elliptic motives. Um, so one of my, I've written, by the way, I'm, I'll post my notes on the web. I'll wait until I, you ask questions and then I'll make all the relevant corrections and then I'll put them on the web. So what, I want to put a mixed hard structure on SL2Z. So, well, this is a discrete object, so I'm going to have to take some completion which I'll explain soon. And the completion is a, an affine group. And so it's got a ring of functions, and it'll be the ring of functions is a Hopf algebra, and that'll be a Hopf algebra in the category of mixed hot structures, more accurately in mixed hot structures. Um, and sort of how, uh, using iterated integrals, These are the iterated integrals of, say, KT Chen. And in this context, uh, a special case of this is done is Menin's iterated Shimura integrals. Which are Chen iterated integrals of holomorphic modular forms. And the story I'm about to tell actually gives a good idea of what the content, you know, what where these guys fit in. And I should say uh, why. There, there are various reasons, and I, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I should tell you why we're going to do it. Well, I should say, first of all, um, this is a fundamental group. It's the fundamental group of M11, moduli space of elliptic curves, and these things give you periods. So, uh, but, so one is just to understand periods uh, of motives, I'm going to write it like this, motives over Z associated to, um, to modular forms of SL2Z. And so Francis has this idea of mixed modular motives. So Brown He's got this category, he like, uh, mixed modular motives, and I'm sure he'll tell you about that next hour. <coughs> another is, uh, another is, I have work with, this is work with Makoto Matsumoto. Whoops. So for years, we're still struggling to finish writing this paper, but we have a paper on universal mixed elliptic motives. So these are somehow motivic local systems over M11 whose graded quotients are Tate twists of the standard variation of hot structure or the standard um, local system. And this, this includes the, the elliptic polar log logs of Balenson and Levin. They're in here. But there's a lot more in here. Um,
And so another one was basically seek, and this is what Francis is doing too, an elliptic analog of um, the theory of mixed state motives. Mixed state motives smooth over Z, and this story, I guess, starts with Deline. I don't remember, I wrote a paper, something like 89, uh, Deline Goncharov. What's that? 05 and Brown. 12. Um, but basically, uh, in some sense, I guess all mixed Tate motives over Z, well, the, the mixed Tate motives you find inside the unipotent fundamental group of P1 minus 0, 1, and infinity with the right base point. Um, this is a, a Tanakian category, and, and Brown's result is that the action of the fundamental group of this category on this guy here is faithful. So this, is, this, this contains all the periods of mixed state motives. And we'd like an elliptic analog of this. And so you, where would you look for the periods of these, these Brown's mixed modular motives? You should look for it in the elliptic analog, which will be this completion of SL2Z. And then Another motivation is to help resolve uh, remaining questions. Questions about mixed state motives. So there are two kinds. Some are about the depth filtration on multi zetas, and we know there are relations on the depth graded quotient that come from cusp forms of SL2Z, and somehow to understand that. And the other thing is to understand mixed state motives over other rings of integers. Okay. Uh, and one way this would work is by specializing to the nodal cubic. All right. So let me talk about uh, relative completion. I guess that was section one. Section two. So this is an idea that, or a, this is a notion that was suggested to me by, in a letter from Deline some time ago in the 80s. <laughs> and and um, so uh, maybe I'll start somewhere fresh. So the basic setting is gamma is equal to a discrete group. And maybe here I'll put example and another example. And so one example that concerns us is SL2Z, and another one we could put pi 1 of, um, say, P1 minus 0, 1, and infinity with some base point. And um, actually, it's good to think of this as pi 1 of GM minus the identity with some base point. And, or alternatively, you can think of pi 1 of an elliptic curve minus the identity. So that's like the elliptic analog of this guy here. And all I care about here is all of these groups are free of rank 2. <clears throat> and the second thing I want is F equals a field of characteristic 0. And... Um, so we can take Q, or you could take R, C, or if you want to do it elatically, you would do QL, and same, uh, the same over here. I'll just put Q. And then R is going to be a reductive uh, group over F, and here we're just going to take SL2 over Q. And here we just take the trivial group. And uh, the last thing we need is rho, which takes gamma into the rational points of the group. This is a Zariski dense representation. Representation. And 
here it's just SL2Z gets included into SL2Q. And here there's nothing to say. <laughs> um, all right, so let me give you, um, so I wanted to find the appropriate completion. I'll flip. Maybe I'll trim this down here. So um, there's two ways to define this, but I'll give you the Tanakian definition, and then I'll give you the naive one. So it's taken me something like 30 years to come around to the Tanakian point of view, but actually uh, it has great advantages. <laughs> um, so um, C is going to be a category, and it's going to be the category of finite dimensional um, gamma modules. Maybe I should put F gamma modules, finite dimensional over F. Um, V that admit a filtration so we'll have a V0 contained say in V1 contained in contained in say Vn equals V by submodules and um, such that gamma acts well it's going to act on each graded quotient acts on each one of these guys here, well, via a representation of R. So I'm going to have a representation of R here, and I'm going to be sloppy with rational points, and then gamma acts, this this homomorphism row of gamma into R, and then R acts on all the graded quotients. And this is a Tanakian category, so that means it's the um, category of representations of some um, affine group or some pro-algebraic group. So this is Tanakian. I'll give you the naive definition in a minute too. So, um, so C is equal to the representations of a group, and I'm going to call that group pi 1 of C. And there's actually the an analog of a base point. Omega takes C into vector spaces over F. It just forgets the group action. <clears throat> and so this, um, so the relative completion, I'll write it as G gamma rho, is by definition this group. It's pi 1 of C omega. So this is an abstract looking definition, but let me try to make it a little more con uh, concrete. Sorry? No, it, it, it's, it's, it's gamma modules that, um, see, the category of R modules is not very interesting from, because it's R's reductive. So it's the category of gamma modules, it'll become clear in a minute, it's the category of gamma modules that admit a filtration where each graded quotient um, is a representation of R and the action of gamma on each graded quotient factors through that. Oh, R doesn't act on the graded quotients. No, R doesn't act, R only acts on the graded quotients. And, um, where are we? So, um, so it's an extension. So s some basic observations is it there's a u gamma rho. It, it's an extension of this guy here is pro unipotent, meaning it's a an inverse limit of unipotent groups, and um, we also have you also have a natural homomorphism from here into G gamma rho, and I guess if I want to be completely accurate, I'll say F rational points. But let me quickly give the naive definition of um, 
very quickly, um, g gamma rho is equal to the inverse limit of uh, groups I'll call g phi. We take the limit over all phi, and what's phi? Um, g will be a group that's an extension of R, so it's an F group by a unipotent group. This guy here is unipotent. And you've got a representation here, which I'll call phi, that lifts our representation row. <coughs> and I, I want to take the inverse limit over these such that phi is a risky dense. So it's sort of like the most general representation you can get where this is an affine F group, this is reductive, and this is pro-unipotent. Right, so the cases of interest to us are the ones I put up here. Um, it, so when R is trivial, this is called uh, unipotent completion. Right. And um, we, we, in this case, uh, we can call it, um, sorry, we can call it, say, gamma unipotent over F. It's the notation I'd like to use. So, um, <clears throat> and this is also what people in rational homotopy theory call Malsev completion. And there's a basic, a, a very basic property that turns out to uh, So there's always a map from the cohomology. Of the, I'll just write G for this group. I'll, if you have any module over this group, there's going to be, uh, you can pull it back to gamma, and you'll get a representation of gamma on this. And so there's a natural homomorphism here, because this is some X in the category C, and this is X in the category of gamma modules. And this is an ISO uh, J equal to 0, 1, an injective J equal to 2 for all V in this category. <coughs> and um, you standard facts about cohomology of these groups tells you that this is the same as the cohomology of the unipotent radical, and you take R invariance. Okay, so. Um, and just a quick remark, this is going to tell us a lot about the unipotent radical because a unipotent group, um, everything is determined by its H1, its H2, and the various cohomology operations between H1 and H2. And so, um, let's keep this up there. So this is, this is going to allow us to get some understanding of what this completion is. Yeah, one other remark is that if um, this may be true in greater generality, but certainly if gamma is finitely generated, the sequence G into R into 1 into U into 1, this guy is split. And the splitting is unique up to conjugation by an element here. So this, um, this implies that U, once you fix the splitting, it tells you this group's isomorphic to G semi-direct product, sorry, R semi-direct product U. And the other thing it tells you is that the Lie algebra, so this is going to be the Lie algebra of U, that this, this has an R action. And so to understand this abstractly as a group, you need to understand what this Lie algebra is as, as, a, as an R module. Sorry? Well, it's basically Levy's theorem. If this were abelian, so H1 of 
reductive group with coefficients here zero, and you just work, work your way back. <coughs> so this is this is just a, basically a souped-up version of Levy. Um, Sorry? If you know the Meissner condition of gamma, and you know all the summers of gamma in terms of R, then uh, you can describe two times two times two bits. When you say the mouse have completion, you mean the unipotent completion of gamma? Right, without any and reference. You can all the of gamma with coefficients of R. I don't think that's enough. That's not enough? No, because. Um, no. Well, I think he means the cohomology of gamma with coefficients in all R modules. Let me, let me think about that on the fly, but I don't think, I, th I think there's more information. So, um, I mean, it will determine something, but it won't determine everything. I mean, there's... Uh, yeah, I think at the end of the talk I can give you an example because SL2Z is going to provide, I think it, uh, I'll give you, an, I'll try to give you an example by the end. All right, so, so let's do some examples. So let's look at the one as the unipotent completion of a free group of, say, a free group on n generators, and say maybe this is x1, xn, and just to see how this works, well, it's going to be a pro-unipotent group, and um, u is going to be the Lie algebra of the unipotent completion, so u is going to be a free Lie algebra on x1, indeterminates indexed by the same set, you complete with respect to degree, and um, ah, why is this free? We know that H1 of U is going to be equal to H1 of Fn, which is isomorphic to Q to the N, and H2 of U, we know it injects into H2 of Fn, but that's equal to zero. And a pro-nilpotent Lie algebra is determine the generators are basically H1 and the relations come from H2. There's no H2, no relation, so it's free. So this implies that U is free. Right, so this is basically the freely algebra generated by H, H lower one completed and the map from, yeah, let, me, let me just not write down the map, um, Sorry? Why, sorry, why is it true that this? Why? Oh, here, sorry. I why is this true? Because for, you've got an extension, G into R into 1 into U, and there's a theory of cohomology of algebraic groups. And this, you can prove this in spectral sequence here, standard thing that inject, you know, the Grotendieck argument about injective. So it gives you that E2 ST equals HS of R, HT of, of U. And it's well known that for a unipotent group, this is the same as the, well, it's this, but this is reductive. So you only get an H0. You don't get any higher cohomology. <coughs> um, all right, so let's do the relative completion uh, of gamma equals SL2Z with the setting we have above. So this one up there. And so um, the first thing is, so R equals SL2. And I'm going to write this as SL, I like thinking of it as SL of H, where H 
h is equal to, I think of this as h1 of some elliptic curve. And you can think, you know, if, if it were this, this, the basis would be a and b. Maybe I'm saying too much here. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so this is, this is going to be, by Poincaré duality, this is h1 of e, which is just um, qa plus qb. But if you take into account uh, Poincaré duality, so SL2z acts on this by gamma takes a minus b into a comma b times gamma. Okay, so it's a left gamma module. <coughs> All right, so the first So the first observation is that, um, uh, yeah. and also the irreducible SLH modules, these are the symmetric powers, Sn of H, right, the symmetric powers. And we want to, and we know that H1 of U um, It's, a, it's an inverse limit of uh, SLH modules, so it's going to be a, some product of p pieces SNH tensored with some vector space. <laughs> and so um, maybe start here is, so SL2Z is virtually free. So what does virtually free mean? It just says it has a finite index subject that's free. And this is easy to see because if you take a, a, a finite, it, yeah, you can take, for example, the level three subgroup that's torsion, that's uh, torsion free, and so you divide the upper half plane by that, you get uh, a non-compact Riemann surface, so the fundamental group is free. And so this tells you that H2, uh, SL2Z, SNH equals zero all n greater than or equal to zero. So by this statement over here, this is telling us that, this is telling us that H2 um, of U, the Lie algebra of the unipotent radical, tensored with S2N, sorry, SN, and you take R invariance, this is equal to zero, all N greater than or equal to zero. So because this is a representation of SL, H. This just implies that H2 of U equals zero, which implies that U is free. So that's sort of convenient, right? So the unipotent radical is free. And so what about the generators? So we know that um, what we need to know is what H1 is. Oh, I should also, yeah, so this is a silly comment. This is standard, minus one and SL2Z is central. So this implies by a trick that I always learn by the name of center kills that uh, H1 um, SL2Z uh, S odd, if you take any odd power, that's zero. So same argument more or less is the fact that there are no uh, modular forms of SL2Z of odd weight. Um, and so we know that, uh, so maybe give these little, and H1 of U um, tensored with, say, SMH, and if you take uh, SLH invariance, this is going to be isomorphic by this statement up here. It's going to be isomorphic to H1 of SL2Z, uh, SNH. Maybe I'll make that an M. 
I should point out every one of these representations is isomorphic to its dual. And so, um, and what is this? I don't know if I'm going to give the correct attribution here, but there are people in the audience who know who can let me know if it's not accurate. Um, but we have Eichler Shimura. And I put Zucker in here for the Hodge structure. I don't, is that, is he the first person to write down the Hodge structure, or is it, or you were? <laughs> Anyway, uh, so let's, let's just think about, we've got the universal curve over M11. So this is the universal elliptic curve. This is F. I'm going to set the lo H to be R1, F lower star of Q. So this is just, I should point out that pi 1 of M11 with any base point you care to choose is isomorphic to SL2Z, right? So this is the local system that corresponds to the fundamental representation of SL2Z. And um, the statement here is that, that H1 of SL2Z with coefficients in S2NH, so this is isomorphic to H1 of M11, S to NH. And let me just take N bigger than zero. If I take N equal to zero, this vanishes because this group has finite H1. Um, so this is equal to, isomorphic to, the direct sum of the cuspidal part of H1. I'm just going to write M, S to N direct sum as a Hodge structure, and that's the Mann and Drinfeld theorem, plus, um, uh, I'll just write it as Q times um, a form C2N plus 2. And this guy here, this guy here is isomorphic to Q minus 2N minus 1, and it is generated Th this form here, I'll write this down in a minute, this corresponds to the Eisenstein series. G2N plus 2. So I'll explain how this determines a, a class here. It's very st standard. And this is the cuspidal cohomology. And this part here splits as an H2N plus 1 part, comma 0, plus an h 0, 2, n plus 1. And I have colors here if they work. Um, this part here, these are the, this, this part here corresponds to the holomorphic cusp forms of weight uh, 2, n plus 2. So it's confusing because there's a weight of a modular form and it's a weight of a Hodge structure and so on. And it's a weight of a representation. They're all slightly different. Um, so, so this is this is a pure guy of weight. This it's a direct sum as Q Hodge structures, and this is a copy of a Tate guy. Right. Yeah. <coughs> so let me quickly tell you how modular forms give you classes. So we're regarding um, M11 as an orbifold. So one way to think of that is to think of working on M11 is the same as working SL2Z equivariantly on the upper half plane. So, so let's suppose this is a modular form of weight 2N plus 2. I can take a form which I'll call omega F, which I write as F of tau, so tau is a coordinate in the upper half plane, times, um, I'm going to write it like this, minus B plus tau A to the 2N. These are the guys over here, d tau. And I'll point out that if you look at 
you, you look at C mod Z plus Z tau, the holomorphic differential on this is equal to, if you take into account Poincaré, well, it's A dual plus tau B dual, but by Poincaré duality, that's minus B plus tau, right? So this is basically the 2 nth power of the abelian differential. And you can say that means this guy should lie in F2n. This guy lies in F1. So this whole thing lies in F2n plus 1. And it's an easy exercise to check that this guy's invariant. So it's an element, it's a holomorphic one form on this, uh, tensored with S2n. Uh, and it is SL2z invariant, which means it's really a form on M11. And, um, <coughs> right, so if F is a cusp form, you've got omega F and you've got omega F bar, so they generate, wherever it is, the, these two guys here, and when F, um, so F equal to say G2N plus 2, I'll call the form C2N plus 2. Right. So let's um, step back for a second and uh, So let, let me point out here, so the upshot is that if I look at U, it's isomorphic, but not naturally. This is not canonical, not in any way that I know, uh, to the Frehley algebra on, say, the direct sum, n bigger than 0. And then for each of those, we're going to take a copy of uh, S to n. 2n plus 1. So this corresponds to an Eisenstein series. This has weight minus 2n. It has Hodge weight minus 2n minus 2. Direct sum, um, the H1 cuspidal uh, part with coefficients in S2n, dual, so uh, tensored with S2n. So it's a big complicated thing. This guy has weight minus 1 and and then we complete the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's got cuspidal generators in weight minus 1. So if you remember anything here, later on I'm going to use the notation. This guy I'm going to call, all of these guys I'll call C, and this part I'll call E, because this is the Eisenstein part. And maybe it's better to think of this guy, H1 of U is canonically isomorphic to this guy up here. That isomorphism does not lift to the Lie algebra, right? So this guy here is going to be, as a Hodge structure, is E plus C. And this guy, weight minus 1, and these are weights less than minus 1. And the bigger N gets them, they're much less. <coughs> All right, so this is... As expected, this is going slower than I want. I'm sort of going for um, all right. So let me put up a theorem. So this is really so theorem. This is myself a long time ago. Um, is that th this is really a special case of a much more general theorem, but for each. I should really say for each tau zero in the upper half plane, there is a natural mixed Hodge structure on the coordinate ring of OGX. So I want to view um, SL2Z is isomorphic to pi 1 of M11, and you can regard points in the upper half plane as base points. So Here's the upper half plane. Here's your tau zero. You've got a gamma de tau. So this would be this pa any path from tau zero to gamma of tau zero in the upper half plane would be an element of pi one corresponding to 
the gamma and this isomorphism. And so um, Gx is the relative completion of pi 1 of m11 with base point x. So the mixed hard structure depends on the base point. And it's compatible with the product, coproduct, antipode, and all of that. And so corollary is <coughs> this, um, the Lie algebra of this relative completion and the Lie algebra of its unipotent radical. These both, uh, these are Lie algebras in the category of pro mixed hard structure. And um, I was going to explain this, but the, in the case of modular curves, I've written this out. Um, the easiest way is to use, you can, this is a direct construction, use Zucker's uh, mixed Hodge complex for uh, computing H1 of M11 with coefficients in, say, SMH. And I'm going to skip this part. Well, I wasn't going to explain it in a lot of detail anyway, but this is explained in something I have on the archive. So, all right. <coughs> um, maybe I'll give this a name. This mixed Hodge complex, I would say, <laughs> and so what are, what are functions here? So elements of O, of O of Gx are um, iterated in it. And the functions you get on gamma of um, elements of the complex part of Zucker's complex for various m. So um, if I, pr l let me try to give you an example, an idea of the example. So for example, Menin's iterated integrals are uh, examples of this. And um, I guess this is about period, so I should write down the period. Um, I could take the iterated integral over some path of, say, omega f, omega g, uh, C to N, um, where these are cusp forms, and this is maybe even put a, a complex conjugate in here, and I could take P composed with this. These are all vector valued. This maybe takes values in S2A, this takes values in S2B, and this takes values in S2N. And so I would take a project, so this iterated integral would take values in the tensor product of these, and P is just some projection to C, right? And that these, these things form a Hopf algebra, and um, uh, you have to make sure this iterated integral depends only on the homotopy class of gamma, but uh, you choose only those iterated integrals. All right, so so that was the old stuff. So one reason for writing up an elementary approach to this is I also proved that um, the set of these guys here, so theorem, the set of O, G, X is an admissible variation of mixed Hodge structure over M11. And so the importance of this is it allows you to say there's a limit mixed Hodge structure. So, um, so there is a limit mixed Hodge structure uh, associated to um, the tangent vector V, which I'll call V, which is ddq. So we have 
the upper half plane mod the group 1, Z, 0, 1. This is really the punctured Q disk. And this, this, this maps to M11, which is the quotient of the upper half plane by all of SL2Z. The coordinate here is Q, which is e to the 2 pi i tau. And so this gives you a tangent vector at the cusp, the unique cusp of M11. And the important fact about this tangent vector is, is that it is non it's integrally defined and it's non-zero for every p, right? So this is, this is non-zero. This is defined over z and non-zero uh, mod p, all p. And the reason that's important, so then, so we regard this limit, so this limit is really, it's a mixed Hodge structure on pi 1 of m11 with base point, this tangent vector at infinity. And so you should think of this, this is an analog, this is the elliptic analog. of pi 1 of p1 minus 0, 1, and infinity with the tangent vector, say, ddw, where w is the unique coordinate on p1 that takes the value 0, 0, 1, at 1, and infinity at infinity. Right? So, um, So, so the point is, if you were studying um, p1 minus 0, 1, and infinity, and you choose any base point other than one of these six standard base points, then um, mod sum p, if these were all rationally defined, that tangent vector would be trivial. And so you couldn't define pi 1, because your base point would have run off the edge of the variety. In genus one, the only two possibilities are to take plus and minus, whoops, uh, plus and minus ddq. All right. Yeah. Um, hmm. Skip this. Right, I think what I want to talk about to finish up is section, I want to talk about the Eisenstein quotient. So this is, well, I was planning to talk about this much later in the talk, and, um, but somehow this is where I want to end, but I'm going to take a different approach from the notes. So, um, so let's draw a picture of M, this is a picture of M11, and the fiber over, this is Q equals zero, and the fiber over this is the nodal cubic, and the fiber over other fibers are just, uh, so this will be, say, the generic fiber here, <coughs> and it's useful to realize that this is P1 uh, with zero identified with infinity. And we have an identity section here. This is the identity. So it crosses here at zero and it'll cross here at one. <coughs> and so we're taking, um, so if I take any, say, tau here, um, I'll call this elliptic curve, say, E tau, uh, pi one of M11 with this base point will act on, say, the, I have to be slightly more careful, but I'm, what I'm saying is morally true. I should really work over the moduli space of elliptic curves plus a non-zero tangent vector at the identity. But uh, because I want an action, so at, at any, I want an action of pi 1 of m11 um, 
say tau, is going to map into the automorphisms of pi 1 of, say, e tau. So this will be e tau. Prime means I remove the identity, and I'm going to take its unipotent fundamental group. And I, the place where I need the tangent vector is I'm going to take some non-zero tangent vector here. And the correct way to do that is to work over, instead of working on m11, it's to work on elliptic curves plus a tangent vector. But it turns out not to matter for some technical reason that I won't go into. Um, here you have a natural tangent vector, and here, uh, namely, the tangent vector I just wrote down over there, ddw. And so you get an action of, I'll call it g d d q, maps into the automorphisms of uh, pi 1 unipotent of what I'm going to call e d d q. So think of uh, this as like a first order. It's the fiber of over, uh, it's, it's basically the Tate curve. It's the fiber over d d q. So just think of it as a little thickening here. It's a smooth curve. But the way to make this sense of this is to talk about limit mixed hard structures. So, and with its tangent vector ddw. So there is such a representation. And it's a morphism of mixed hard structures. So let me talk a little bit about what this guy looks like. So earlier in the talk, I, so this is a free group Sorry, I put a prime, right? So it, this guy is a free group of rank two, and um, yeah. So this this guy to this has a natural limit mixed hard structure. So this has a natural limit mixed hard structure, and you can prove that this guy here is a morphism. Sorry. Yeah, I just means remove the identity. I'm tired of writing minus zero. So, um, <clears throat> so let's look at this guy here. So the first thing to notice is that if you look at the, I've got this standard variation of mixed Hodge structure over M11. And it, what's its fiber? What's the fiber of this guy? So I'm sort of being sloppy. I want to think of DDQ as being a point here. What's the fiber? That would be the limit mixed hard structure on this guy here associated with this tangent vector. And so that's HDDQ. And it's actually an exercise. If you do it in integrally, it's Z plus Z of minus 1. Mm -hmm. If you took, say, lambda times this, it would be an extension of Z, by, Z of one, minus 1 by Z that corresponded to lambda in C star. So this is the only split tangent vector, integrally split tangent vector. So, and this is where things get more technical. So this has a weight filtration. I want to call the weight filtration of this guy M dot because it's really the monodromy weight filtration. So this has got weight 0 and plus 2 but from the point of view of M, but from the point of view of W, it has weight uh, plus 1. All right, so what's, what's uh, if I take um, GR, um, uh, w dot of, uh, I'm going to call P. So P is going to be the Lie algebra of this guy. So P is equal to the Lie algebra. So it's, so what we know about P is P is unnaturally isomorphic to the freely algebra on H1 of E prime. And what is that? Well, H upper 1 is Z plus Z of minus 1. So this is going to be the freely algebra on Q plus Q of 1. Completed. Right? And so the important thing here is that this guy is Tate. It's mixed Tate. So this is actually, um, right, so G of R of WP is naturally isomorphic to the Frehley algebra on H1 of EDDQ. Right. 
And like I said, this is the freely, this is naturally isomorphic to the freely algebra on Q plus Q of one. You can actually show that this Lie algebra is an object of the category, the Hodge realization of the, an object of category of mixed tape motors. All right. So what, what's happening here is that we have a homomorphism here from G, uh, the relative completion of DDQ. It maps into the order morphisms of, uh, say, P, this freely algebra of rank two, but um, everything that appears in here is mixed tape. But this guy has motives coming from cusp forms. It has cuspidal stuff here. And so I want to look at the maximal quotient of this guy. Um, okay, so what's happening? Some of the great, if I look at the Lie algebra or the coordinate ring, you see graded quotients that look like H1 cuspidal tensored with some tensor power of H and maybe Tate twisted, right? In this guy. And the, these, these Hodge structures here are not Tate. They have this 2n plus 1, 0, 0, 2n plus 1 stuff here. Here I want, here I want to look at the maximal quotient where, say, in the Lie algebra, the only things you get are things like Tate twists of symmetric powers of, of the representation. And that's, this is going to factor through here. Right. So it turns out to be an interesting and sort of, I think, important problem to understand what this guy is. And so let me try to explain. Um, yeah. Um, you can do this at any base point, but if you do it at infinity, this is the maximal mixed Tate quotient, right? And, um, you know, if you're really optimistic, you might believe this guy is injective, but we've got no way of knowing that. Let me describe this G ice a little bit and try to say something. It maps to SLH into 1, and it has a unipotent radical. And the unipotent radical here is, remember that H1 of U, the U coming from this guy, was an Eisenstein part plus a cuspidal part. Well, this part's got to go away, and you can see you get this part. And so H1 of U ice is going to be isomorphic to the direct sum, it's actually the direct product of uh, S to NH, but think of it as HDDQ, Tate twisted by 2N plus 1. Right, so this, a, this HDDQ is Q plus Q of minus 1, and then you have to Tate twist it. And so you've gotten, it, which is really just equal to the Eisenstein part of this guy up here. So what there's a computation that Matsumoto and I did seven years ago that suggested, and it was a computation in, in the Atal setting that suggested that the generators here should satisfy relations. And um, so there are expected relations. Yeah. And so I'm going to take a highest weight vector here. I'll call it E. 2n plus 2 is equal to a highest weight vector. And there's a natural torus coming from the limit mixed Hodge structure. So um, there are expected relations between the E 2n plus 2s. So this guy you might think is free, but it turns out not to be free. We definitely know that thanks to Francis. But I mean, we expected this and then one had to compute periods. But what, let me give you an example. So, so actually, to give you some history, um, once we realized this, I tried to look for the first uh, that come from, from cusp forms. So what, what's happening here is that these, 
cuspidal gener generators of the unipotent radical here are going to become relations here. And I want to give a very brief idea why. And the real, and I want to mention two things. So when, I, when we realized this, I gave this problem to an undergrad, then undergraduate Duke, whose name is Aaron Pollock, and he not only, he found all these relations. And these relations should be of all degrees greater than or equal to two. So he managed to find absolutely what the quadratic relations are between these guys. And he also managed to find modulo some filter, sorry, in the derivation algebra, in the Lie algebra of that guy. And he found um, modulo some filtration there. He found relations of all degrees coming from cusp forms. And so what Francis did, so Brown did a computation that I won't state, um, but computed periods. So, so this work of Pollock here. So again, I stress that we found relations in here, but it wasn't, you know, you have to prove that you, they actually occur here. They could have just been an artifact of working in some representation. This guy could have had free unipotent radical. But Francis's computations prove that they hold here and also in some motivic situation. So computation implies Pollock's relations. All of Pollock's relations lift uh, to U ice. Um, I'm not a, I don't like conjectures without much evidence. I mean, okay, he, well, there's a, I think there's a filtration here that I think he called theta. And mod theta three, I think we can prove that there's a corresponding filtration here. Basically, uh, the second, the third term of the lower central series. So if you mod this out by L3 of U, then this guy injects. But you can already see all the relations here. Um, but, you know, and if you start to assume certain conjectures in number theory, then maybe, uh, no, you still can't. You'd have to, you'd ha you know, figuring out relations between certain derivations, I think, is hard. Anyway, I should stop. I've gone over time. Sorry about that. <coughs> <coughs>